Today's scripture comes from 1 John chapter 3, verses 7 through 18. This is from the New Living Translation Bible, and it can be found on page 7 if you'd like to follow along. Dear children, don't let anyone deceive you about this. When people do what is right, it shows that they are righteous, even as Christ is righteous. But when people keep on sinning, it shows that they belong to the devil, who has been sinning since the beginning. But the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. Those who have been born into God's family do not make a practice of sinning, because God's life is in them. So they can't keep on sinning, because they are children of God. So now we can tell who are children of God and who are children of the devil. Anyone who does not live righteously and does not love other believers does not belong to God. This is the message you had heard from the beginning. We should love one another. We must not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and killed his brother. And why did he kill him? Because Cain had been doing what was evil and his brother had been doing what was righteous. So don't be surprised, dear brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. If we love our brothers and sisters who are believers, it proves that we have passed from death to life. But a person who has no love is still dead. Anyone who hates another brother or sister is really a murderer at heart. And you know that murderers don't have eternal life within them. We know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? Dear children, Let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. The word of God for the people of God. Father, we thank you for your presence with us so far in this hour and throughout the morning. Thank you that you are here as we praise you with voices and with hearts. Thank you that you are here by your spirit and by your word, and we ask that you help us to hear your voice today. Help us to be responsive to your voice. Give us a desire to say yes to you as you speak to us, as you challenge us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I'd like for you to open to page 8 in your bulletin and kind of leave it there because I will be looking to you for assistance with some scripture this morning. You've come to expect that, right? So thank you in advance for your help with that this morning. The Greek writer, Nikos K, was hiking on the island of Crete. At dusk he entered an unfamiliar village. Where would he look for a night's lodging? The people of Crete are known for their hospitality, so he decided to look for the home of the village priest. He knocked on a nearby door. An old woman opened it. Could you show me where the priest lives? She was glad to. He followed her to a second doorway. This is the priest's house, she said, and sighed. You're welcome to stay at my house if you don't mind the mess. But he had already knocked on the priest's door and he heard steps coming. The door opened. An old man with a snow-white beard offered his hand. Welcome, are you a stranger? Come in. Nikos heard voices. He saw several women slip into a back room. The priest said, My wife is a little indisposed. Please excuse her. But I can fix you supper and prepare a bed for the night. He looked pale eyes swollen as if from weeping. But Nikos thought nothing of it. He ate, he slept, 
In the morning he ate the breakfast offered by the priest. Nico shook his hand, thanked him, and said goodbye. God bless you, my son. Christ be with you. As Nikos was leaving the village, an old man greeted him on the road. Where did you spend the night, sir? At the priest's house. The old man sighed. Ah, poor fellow. His only son died yesterday morning. Didn't you know? Nikos was silent, his eyes filled with tears. What are you crying about, the old man asked. Well, you are young. Perhaps you haven't gotten used to death yet. God bless you. Have a pleasant journey. <clears throat> Costly love is our focus this morning. There's a great quote from Mother Teresa that I didn't find in time to get in the bulletin, but it's there anyhow. She says, I have found a paradox that if you love until it hurts, there can be no more hurt, only love. If you love until it hurts, there can be no more hurt, only more love. So costly love is our focus this morning as we look at 1 John chapter 3 and verse 16. The Brookhill pastors have started a sermon series called Exploring the Famous 316s. We're looking at five different Bible verses that fall in the third chapter and the 16th verse in those various New Testament books. And this morning, we're looking at 1 John 3.16. I've given this message a title that asks a question. Where is your love in action? I'd like for us to think about that, to reflect on it, and I want you specifically, not rhetorically, to think about the answer to that question. In the normal course of events in your life, where is the love of God demonstrated toward others? That's what we're trying to reflect on this morning. Today I'm pushing the concept of sacrificial love. Many of us have heard of the Greek word agape, which we translate into modern English as love. This is not brotherly love. It is not affectionate love. It is not erotic love. But agape is unconditional love, sacrificial love. It is wanting God's best for that person. That is really what agape love is. Agape love doesn't begin with an emotion. It begins with a decision. And that's probably the most important sentence of the morning, in my view. So I'm going to say it again. Agape love does not begin with an emotion. It begins with a decision. We make a decision to love, and then agape love continues as an action. Decision, action. We've got to do something. We've got to express love. It doesn't exist simply as an emotion. It exists as an action. And so this morning, let's think about costly love under two headings. First of all, from verse 16, we read that Jesus is our example of sacrificial love. Read that verse together with me, if you would. This is how we've come to understand and experience love. Christ sacrificed His life for us. This is why we ought to live sacrificially for our fellow believers and not just be out for ourselves. We're familiar with the concept of self-sacrifice. The baseball player hits a high fly ball. It hangs in the air for a few seconds so that the base runner can advance from one base to the next. The batter is out when the ball is caught, but he has hit a sacrifice fly for the good of the team. We're familiar with that concept, aren't we? Another example is seen in warfare. My wife and I just finished watching all 18 hours of the documentary on the Vietnam War by Ken Burns and Lynn Novick. We watched it on the laptop, sitting on the couch, 
And I think I stayed awake for all 18 hours. Almost always I'm asleep in 15 minutes if it's most programs, but it was good. We saw in that documentary that when soldiers battle together against the common enemy, a strong bond is created between a soldier and his comrades. Every platoon is thought of as a band of brothers. When a soldier is wounded or killed on the battlefield, U.S. soldiers or Marines will never leave a buddy behind. Even under enemy fire, the soldier advances to save the life of his brother. He endangers his own life to retrieve the body of a fallen comrade. This is an extreme example of sacrifice. So we return to John's thought, sacrificial love. Jesus gave his life for us on the cross. His body was broken, his blood was shed for our forgiveness. So that we could know, so that we could experience the new life, the abundant life. This is what God has created us to be, complete in him through what Jesus Christ has done for us. This is sacrifice. Jesus made a decision. The decision led to an action. John says Jesus is our example of sacrificial love and that in the same way, we should love our brothers and sisters. So let's think for a moment about how we do this. It's unlikely that we'll need to die to give our own lives so that someone else can live. But we can use what God has given us to help others. We have the gift of time. You have the gift of time and so do I. Immensely valuable, this gift of time. I've heard it said, and you have too, no doubt, that what produces greatness in a person is usually not some great event, but it's the living of every day, the living of every hour, the living out of time in a way that is productive, in a way that's beautiful, in a way that is, redeem is redemptive. We have the gift of time. We can invest our time to visit the shut-in in the nursing home. And Let's, so let's break this down a little bit. Brook Hill is, at least among us, known as a place where we have a lot of volunteers who do a lot of things. So let's just think about that for a moment or two. There have been women who for many years have visited shut-ins in a number of nursing homes and have had a powerful ministry in that way. There are volunteers at Brook Hill who have tutored uh, needy students students who need help in their, in their work. One for more than 20 years. One Brook Hill volunteer in, invested 20 days in this Habitat for Humanity project that we just heard of. He has a full-time job, but every Friday and Saturday he was there for a total of about 20 days. We can, we can invest our time for the benefit of others. And in verse 17, John suggests another way to demonstrate this sacrificial love, and that is by financially helping others. Read with me, if you would, verse 17. If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? We have, let's be flat out open about it, we have money. We have money filthy lucre. You know, we have money. You have funds. Maybe not as much as the other person beside you in the pew, but we have this as another thing that God has given to us. Maybe you remember this barnyard conversation. Pig asks, if you know it, don't, don't laugh too soon. Pig asks, what will we give our guest for breakfast? Hen says, let's give her ham and eggs. <laughs> to which the pig replies, well, that would be easy for you, but
But for me, it would be total commitment. <laughs> that wasn't a very big laugh, really. <laughs> you can measure the extent of your sacrifice by how much it hurts. Can I just say, if it never hurts you a bit, whether it's in the giving of time or money or whatever, you're not giving, probably giving sacrificially yet. There's got to be a little bit of a pinch. And that's when sacrificial giving begins. So we're talking about sacrificial love, but I want to interrupt at this point with a word of caution to balance love with truth. So I'm an outreach pastor, and almost every day I encounter people with great needs, people whose lives have been ravaged by the enemy. And many of us have friends and relatives, others that we're acquainted with, who struggle with alcoholism or with various kinds of addiction. They need money to live, but they have a deeper need. They need deliverance from the power of the enemy. It was interesting earlier in the chapter, Kathy read, that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. They need to be delivered from the power of the enemy. They need sobriety in their lives. They need a job. They need to build the constructive habits that make for a satisfying life. And sometimes agape love should say, no, no, no to bailing them out. No to providing for them in ways that are ultimately destructive. Sometimes agape love needs to be tough love. And so there on the page, again, would you read with me from Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 4? He who has a slack hand becomes poor, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. And then from 2 Thessalonians 3, Don't you remember the rule we had when we lived with you? If you don't work, you don't eat. And now we're getting reports that a bunch of lazy good-for-nothings are taking advantage of you. This must not be tolerated. We command them to get to work immediately. No excuses, no arguments, and earn their own keep. Friends, don't slack off from doing your duty. If anyone refuses to obey our clear command written in this letter, don't let him get by with it. Point out such a person and refuse to subsidize his freeloading. Maybe then he'll think twice. But don't treat him as an enemy. Sit him down and talk about the problem as someone who cares. So here we have the Apostle Paul, the Apostle of Grace. We've been reading from the Apostle John, the Apostle of Love. We understand that there is a balancing act that needs to take place. It's messy. It's difficult. We can't really walk this line perfectly. I feel like I'm on a tightrope, and it's, it's messy business. We need friends. We need all of the wisdom that God can give. We need really something beyond ourselves. We need input from others that we see to be wise. We need to reflect upon a situation and, and to realize that yes is not always the right answer. Here the Apostle Paul gives a practical balance to costly love. We can call it costly, tough love. Because tough love is costly. Just ask the mother who refuses to subsidize the lifestyle of her alcoholic child. Well, now that you're all down, let's conclude the message. And this is with the second point from verse 18, that in loving others, let's go beyond words to actions. Read that with me, please. Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. Agape love is not a spectator sport. It is not armchair quarterbacking. Agape love focuses on action. What is it that needs to be done? 
And what can I do to change the situation? What can I do to meet the need? And so I'm asking the question that I did at the beginning. Where is your love in action? What can you point to in your daily or weekly or monthly routine that says, yes, in this I'm seeking to demonstrate a decision that I've made, an action that I'm taking to seek God's best for somebody. And so that's where I'm volunteering. That's where I'm serving. That's where I'm seeking to help. Not a rhetorical question. Think, let's think about it and see if the Lord says, yeah, you're doing great, or a little bit more is needed. Let's be listening to the Holy Spirit there. Chuck Colson tells the story of a group of American prisoners of war during World War II who were made to do hard labor at a prison camp. Each had a shovel and would dig all day, then come in and give an account of his tool in the evening. One evening, 20 prisoners were lined up by the guard and the shovels were counted. The guard counted 19 shovels and turned in rage at the 20 prisoners, demanding to know which one did not bring his shovel back. No one responded. The guard took out his gun and said that he would shoot five men if the guilty prisoner did not step forward. After a moment of silence, the 19-year-old soldier stepped forward with his head bowed down. The guard grabbed him, took him to the side, and shot him in the head. Then he turned to warn the others that they better be more careful than that guy was. When the guard left, the men counted the shovels, and there were 20. The guard had miscounted. The boy had given his life for his friends. Jesus said, greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. just want to repeat Mother Teresa's thought from the beginning of Paradox. If you love until it hurts, there can be no more hurt, only more love. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for your presence with us. Lord, we need your wisdom, we need your grace, we need your help as we seek to live lives of your agape love, your sacrificial love. Fill us, first of all, with that love. And then show us the avenues by which we can release that love to those around us in a broken world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.